Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome back to The Lot Walk. It's the podcast where we talk about everything and anything automotive. As you know, I am your host, Chaz, Vice President of Sales and Client Success over here at Car Motivators. And today I've got a really special guest. Before I introduce him, man, he's got some accolades. I got to go through this list. Expert, he's just an expert in multitudes of areas. You know, we got a, he's a long accomplished automotive leader. Um, he's been turning suffering car dealerships around his entire life, building winning cultures. He specializes in that. He took his last dealership, which was a Mercedes Benz store, to top 20 in the nation in just one year. He currently owns a company uh, called Unity Wellness Group. In his previous lifetime, he was a journalist for Billboard and CNN. And, oh, didn't mention this yet. He also was a professional wrestler, Canadian heavyweight champion. I've never interviewed a professional wrestler for. This is so cool. Um, All of this embodied in the one and only Mr. Dan Turner. Dan, how are you doing today, sir? I'm fantastic, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I love what you guys are doing, uh, getting the word out there and helping to motivate people um, in the automotive space. I think this is fantastic. Yeah, man. You know, gosh, that's what just a crazy heck of a background you got there. You know, uh, wow. I, like I said, I've just never been so star studded on a show before my own show. You know, <laughs> I'm starstruck on my own show here, like talking to a Canadian heavyweight champion. I'm a big fan of wrestling in the past, and, and you know, uh, just crazy. But I want to I know, how did you end up in the wrestling ring and how did that steer you into the amazing places that you've been? If you could sum that up in a few minutes, I know that's a lot to, to, to surmise, yeah. but how did you end up in the wrestling world? Well, I uh, grew up dirt poor. I grew up, um, you know, um, with, with no money. And I started working at an arena when I was a kid. I'm Canadian. I started working at an arena and I had to sell popcorn and peanuts so we could eat, literally, because we'd be uh-huh. out of money by the 15th, 16th of the month. So the wrestling would come every three weeks, and um, and uh, they would dr- draw big crowds. It was the AWA. Uh, they were out of Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was up in Winnipeg, Canada, and um, the AWA uh, would, would rock the arena. And uh, as life went on, I knew I wanted to get out of my situation, um, and so I thought I could become a pro football player. So I put everything I had into that. didn't work mm-hmm. out. I knew a guy uh, from the from that uh, his dad was a wrestler. And he was a wrestler, and he talked me into going to a camp. Uh, while I was in the camp, I did the early version of what was uh, what's UFC now, but in those days it uh, it wasn't, uh, and that was craziness. It was tournaments; you just kept fighting if you won. Um, and uh, eventually, I got a break with the AWA, big wrestling company. I was one of about two people, and then um, you know, and then my career just kind of took off from there. Uh, wow. I ended up in Mexico um, for I, I spent uh, three years down in Mexico. Lived in Mexico City, um, worked for the biggest wrestling company in the world, uh, CMLL. We're doing 20,000 people every Friday, 45,000 on Sundays in, in Monterey in the stadium. Um, so wrestling was huge, but I knew I had to have something to fall back on, so that was journalism. So I went to broadcast school uh, before I got into wrestling, and so I had that. So every now and again, I quit, and I just get tired. In my day, it was 320 shows a year. I get tired. I go yeah. um, take a journalist job. And so what happened uh, was I was working at a newspaper in Canada, got talked into going to Mexico to wrestle. I, I didn't know tacos weren't crunchy when I got to Mexico. <laughs> I was such a dumb Canadian. And uh, I had a Berlitz Guide to Spanish. I'm trying to figure out where the bathrooms are. Anyways, it takes off in Mexico. We do great. And then I say, you know, look, enough's enough, my body and everything else. So then I go back into journalism. I became a columnist in Mexico City at an English language newspaper. And from oh, there, wow. I got the uh, CNN uh, gig and, and covered the Mexican president, Carlos Salinas. Um, and Carlos Salinas was interesting because he wasn't a big guy, and but he had his machismo. So uh, the, the famous Carlos Salinas handshake. So every time I'd meet the president, he would grip my hand and squeeze it so hard and I would <laughs> squeeze back. And, you know, his Secret Service and all the other journalists would be like, what's going on with you two? But we got along really well. So... <laughs> so anyways, that's what happened uh, from the uh, wrestling to the journalism from there up to New York City um, and uh, got on with the Billboard publications and a lot of uh, business writing on, on the music business, entertainment business and things like that. And then came to California and became a tent sales uh, person. Uh, uh, I was making documentary films and on the weekend went out and sold cars at tent sales and that just wow. sort of uh, took off. Yeah. 
uh, me and a couple of buddies, we formed a little team and, and, you know, no drinking, no drugs. We were there to sell cars on a weekend, first there, last to leave. And we became very successful at it to the point where we had people working for us and we would, we would send them out to dealers and stuff, promoted uh, tent sales at one point um, with, a, with another fellow. And then dealers started saying, could you fix my internet department? You know, because I was really into internet and stuff. So I fixed their yeah. internet department and finally ended up uh, inside a dealership, Sonic. I got uh, hired by Sonic, ran uh, two stores, internet departments, and then ended up um, uh, jumping over to AutoNation and, um, and had a long and great career with AutoNation, a company I, I truly loved and still love. Um, but I've had two runs with them. And the first one I started as internet director, went to GSM, fixing uh, dealerships as a GSM, then became a GM. And, um, and, and then once I became a GM, I, I got a broken store, got it turned around at the same time, got another store, at the same time, got another store. At one point <laughs> in my early GM career, I had four stores under me um, and, um, and turned them all around. So mm -hmm. um, that sort of put my, my career in the automotive business on a bit of a rocket ship. So um, off I went. And then I left. I bought part of a dealership. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work out. My business partner went, fixed a couple of other dealerships, and then AutoNation uh, and I talked again. And so I went back. And uh, my last run was, uh, was uh, I came back to the company. They had a Ford store, needed some help. I got it fixed in four months. And then uh, there was a union that gotten into one of our stores. I went up and I took on the uh, union. And um, in 19 months, the employees decided they didn't need the union anymore. They thought they'd be better off with, with us as the team we had built. Oh wow! The union out, yeah, it was huge, huge for the company. Voted the union out, and then, um, and then uh, from there went down to Mercedes Benz. So wow. that's sort yeah. of the capsulated uh, 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 version of my my uh, run. You know, it's funny that you talk about you know how you had this like humble beginnings, right, and just selling concessions, and then you know you tried your hand at football. And that didn't necessarily work out for you, and you somehow landed in the professional wrestling ring as a title champion. You know, ironically for for us American folks, that that story kind of rings really similar to another wrestler we know. Um, you probably know who it is, and that's Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right? Because oh. he started out as a as a remember he was his whole thing oh, is yeah. he was he was number fifty four, right? Because a fifty three man roster, and Taxi then he ended squad. up being a and he ended up being a wrestler as well. But it's it's so cool how how you know in general whether it's The Rock or you or anybody how a lot of wrestlers come from these humble beginnings and and they mm -hmm. never forget it right and it's just a, such a really great feel good story to hear you know the hard work that paid off right mm -hmm. and and what, thank first and foremost thank you for sharing that with me and I'm gonna need our assistant to go ahead and get like an eight by ten sign. So you can send it to yeah. my address. It's all good. Uh, but uh, but really, so truly, uh, really intrigued by how you 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 just ended up in California and started doing these tent sales, and all of a sudden it became you kind of went out there to look. Sounds like you kind of went out there to make a few bucks and ended up finding a career out of it, right? Huge, and, um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit. Says, oh, and by the way, um, as also a fellow former journalist student. Appreciate you. It tells me a lot about you. You're the most hardest working man on the planet, and you're willing to do more than what it takes to get the job done. Because I know my journalist mm -hmm. students, <laughs> you know. And, but secondly, <laughs> um, uh, obviously working at Mercedes Benz, right? So let's 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 kind of get into the automotive side of things more into the weeds, right? You know, working at Mercedes Benz, you're at Mercedes Benz of South Bay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know automatically just being a former employee of Mercedes Benz myself. Um, that culture is everything, right? Winning culture is everything. Mm -hmm. Building the right team is everything because they have a standard. It's called, you know, the best of the best for the reason, right? That's the, that's the mm -hmm. slogan. How did you find yourself uh, in the Mercedes um, and what was going wrong there? And, and, and walk me through uh, how you turned that around. So that wasn't really a story. Like most of my stores are been big turnarounds. That store was a good store, actually. And okay. I went in and um, and it was kind of a reward to me for, uh, you know, uh, my, my victory over the union. Right. And uh, fixing that store and putting the people in place and growing the people uh, in the previous store was a Honda store. I promoted 13 people in the I was up there for maybe three years, just shy of three years. 
and promoted 13, 16 people, the new seats in the store. I'm really big on growing people as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably had uh, trained uh, at least half a dozen AutoNation GMs. They'd send them to me to ride with me and, and, and see how I, I did things. So Mercedes was a unique store because it was a, it's a really good store. It was a great store when I got it. But it, it, um, we just felt that we could amplify the uh, sales side of it. And, um, and it was actually some of my big, biggest victories came out of the service side. Increased wow. the service department by $2 million in that same year. Oh, um, nice. Literally set all-time store records uh, for uh, uh, service dollars and things like that. So I was, I, I'm as proud as what we did in service as I was on the sales side. And with me in my career, that's the first place, one of the first places I would look when I would go into a dealership would be the service department and just change the entire culture. I'm really big on changing cultures and um, and change the culture of the uh, of the service department. And, you know, uh, again, that's why the company had sent me up to um, um, our Honda store uh, for the fact that I am good at changing cultures and, and, and turning things around. But I've done that my whole career. So um, yeah. I'm very proud of the, the strides we made on the service side and the people we identified in that store to grow as well. Um, I found some some great individuals in that store. Um, and, uh, one will become a GM and I bet you she, she will become a GM by year end. Uh, not necessarily wow. that store, you know, as AutoNation works, they own a number of stores, but, um, yeah, very, very proud. I've, I've actually through my career groomed a number of GMs and had them climb the, uh, the, the, uh, the way up. Um, so it's, it's been good. It's a good company. If you want to grow great company to grow in. Yeah, sounds like it. It sounds like you made a big positive impact there. Let's uh let's peel the I mean you had mentioned, you know, how automation and kind of lead lead it up to that, right? It was kind of like you mm -hmm. like you said, your reward of sorts for doing what you did with automation. So let's even let's peel this onion back a little bit more, right? Let's go down another layer, right? And talk a little bit about automation. You know, one of the things that we champion like like you said yourself, one of the things here at Car Motivators we champion is mm -hmm. is people development, right? Uh building winning cultures uh by by coaching the car business and not training them not giving them a handout and expecting them to know how to do their job, but truly bringing them uh, from start to finish, coaching them properly and building a winning culture from within. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that we, we love to speak into our coaching clients is, you know, if they build it, they'll own it. And if they'll own it, then they'll act on it. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's their idea. It's what they create that really ends up surging and becoming uh, the catalyst that changes their culture forever. And that seems like something that's super important to you. Talk to me about the Auto Nation days. You know, you had a lot of a uh, a lot. You 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 were like a paradigm shift for these folks. How did you get buy in from the staff? And was it limited from store to store? Or did you did you use the same approach and get buy in from the staff that way? Every store, no. Uh, I I uh, will tell you that you will have sometimes clicks in a store that won't necessarily buy in at the start, but when they see everybody else buy in, they'll jump in behind them often. And if they don't, you know, it's funny because you look at empathy, right? Empathy goes to a certain level and then it becomes mm -hmm. entitlement. You've got to be smart enough to identify the end of that empathy line to the entitlement line, right? Absolutely. And then address that and not be afraid to address it. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you with auto nations, an interesting company, they, they, um, I, I, love that company they um they'll put it out there as to okay here's our parameters and you can run your operation within them and especially if they trust you right i tell mm -hmm. every new gm to auto nation for example uh great company look at the boulders in the creek and swim between them you'll forever be successful in auto nation so i did the same thing in every single turnaround i've done now some stores were really broken that i turned around others not so much but still you know twisted them and got more out of them so so my uh, MO would be to go in, spend a couple of weeks just watching uh, and just seeing what's going on, uh, whether it be AutoNation or my time outside of AutoNation, right? Um, often when, when you get brought into a store, and this isn't just AutoNation, I think this is in general, uh, you know, they expect you to walk in and just start firing people. And that's never been the case with me. Uh, I always say, look, we saw something in this person when we hired them, right? Let's yeah. find out where that, where that person went. 
if they're not performing, of course, right? Let's find out if the person's in the right seat. Sometimes you have to have a tough conversation with people, and I've had these many times where they're just in the wrong seat. Now, they might have been in the seat they've been in for a while. However, that's not the right seat, and nobody's addressed it and put them in a position to win, right? And this yeah, comes from my course. sports background. I, I always think, you know, look, when I was trying to become a pro football player, a pro wrestler, I surrounded myself with everything I could to win. I wanted to work out in the best gyms. I wanted to have the best people working with me and and everything else to, to yeah. be able to succeed. And that's the same mentality I have with running dealerships. So let's find out what's going on with these people. Are they in the right seat? How's their head? Um, you know, are, are they, can they do more? Have they hit their, their capacity as far as where they're at? And let's understand that then and then give them the help that can grow them if there's any opportunity for them to grow, right? Let's yeah. do all of these things. Now, I think that if, if it gets to the point where the person's just not going to make it with you, then you're doing yourself and them a favor in parting ways. Very few stores have I had to part ways with a lot of people. My turnover at the Mercedes uh, Benz store was the lowest of all our our, uh, our Benz dealerships in the country. Wow. Um, yeah. Matter of fact, That's when great. I left, I was going to make a presentation on on, on turnover uh, in our leadership uh, conference. But it, it was always like that. I mean, my stores had very little turnover because I got people to buy in because I did a few things, right? I didn't overpromise and underdeliver, right? Matter of fact, it was the opposite. Um, and I love to promote from within. So I would identify someone. I would ta actually task my managers to identify people in their departments. So I had a bench player in every single department so that we could give somebody an opportunity down the road to grow and step into that position. Now, they might not be ready to step into that position. However, if somebody gets in there and you and I had the same conversation with, with people when I would do it, look, you're going to fall down and I'm going to pick you up, dust your pants off. We're going to move you forward. That's OK. That means you're growing. If you don't fall down, you're not growing. And then I've got bigger concerns about what's really going on here. So, so we had a lot of yeah, a lot of those kind of conversations. However, those people never forget the opportunity you gave them and they'll run through walls for you. They yeah, will you literally know, run through walls. It's like, uh, by the way, man, that's like uh, you music to my ears because I don't know if you ever watch ESPN and seen Around the Horn, but like I felt like while you were talking there, I felt like Tony Reale just constantly giving you points. Ding, 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 ding because I'm like, man, he's like speaking all the things that that I believe in in the automotive industry, and you know, mm -hmm. you know, talking about you're talking about employee turnover. That's just such a big issue in the automotive industry. And how do you tackle that? Well, you kind of hit the nail right on the head, right? Like it's like stop trying to hire pe hire people from for positions and hire people that fit your culture, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if mm -hmm. you hire good people, even if they do hit their ceiling in certain in certain uh, positions, that doesn't mean that they're useless. That just means that they might not be in the right place that's best for them, you know? Mm -hmm. But you want to keep those folks, right? You want to keep the ones that understand the workplace culture, and you want to find a place for the people like that, right? And that, mm -hmm. you know, I can see that that's just such a special part about what you bring to the automotive industry and what you've done for the automotive industry is promoting and hiring from within you know, something else that we love to say here is that, you know, we quote Maya Angelou, you know, people don't remember what you said or what you did, but it's about how you made them feel. Absolutely. And, and, and it seems like you're like right in tune with that with every employee you've ever had. And that's why people love working with you, of course, right? Because they they know that the workplace culture is is going in the right direction. The ship is going in the right direction and the captain believes in his men and women, right? Mm-hmm. You can't work for a better organization when you feel that way as a frontline employee, right? But mm -hmm. let's so so t speaking of like main reasons dealerships struggle, right? We well, just talked well, about. I can I can just add something else to that. Yeah, too. sure, absolutely. So, yeah. So so now let's just peel the onion back a little bit more. So when you're looking at people who you're going to start moving around, they don't. And I have this conversation a lot with people too. They don't need to be the top person. For example, if I'm going to promote somebody to my finance department. You don't have to be number one in the internet department. Now, I expect you to be in the top quarter, but there's other things that I look at in an individual 
before I promote them to see if they've got all the elements that I look oh, for. Oh, sure. Yeah. Are, are they helping other, they, they might not be the top internet person, for example, salesperson. However, they're helping out other people. If a manager needs something, no questions, they're going to go help the manager. So they've got that with them. I promoted a, uh, uh, a young lady from a finance department who had mediocre finance numbers. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to the store, I interviewed the entire finance department and asked them what their goals were. And she was actually the only one that told me she wanted to get to the desk. That got my attention. Go get her, right? Her numbers were mediocre. However, the things she did around her numbers were amazing. Like I saw her jumping in on the CITs and bringing me this report and that report and coming to me and asking me, do you want this, this, and this done? Do you want this report? Mm -hmm. This person here I promoted when I had the opportunity to sales manager even though she wasn't the top of the, the class, promote, but I saw everything else in her. Promoted her sales manager, became a great sales manager. I brought her down to Mercedes as a sales manager. Within three, four months, promoted her to GSM. And this person's going to end up being a GM. And she's incredibly bright, talented, and smart. I had another young lady in my, in my uh, service department. This is really good. A year and a half, uh, but, uh, no, but four or five months before I took over the store was in the back filing uh, folders, okay? Let's put this in, in perspective. Ended up on the service drive, right? Got onto the service drive a few months before I got there. Um, I identified her, she had a lot, the phone would ring, other people don't answer, she'd jump on it. There's a heater, she jumps on it. You could take her a heater, she would handle it, boom. Tells me, wow, this person's got a, a bright future in front of them. Start working with her, start working with her, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, she became the top service writer. This person was filing folders like a year earlier, became a wow. top service writer and, uh, and was making all the money as, as, as one of the top service writers. So wow. you find these little diamonds and I, I think you have to start developing and looking at them because these are your future leaders. You know, and yeah, if you've got a course. number of stores, it might not be in that store, it might be in another store, it might be somewhere else. But this is how you start building teams. And again, teams that will run through walls for you. You know, and to your previous point uh, about building a winning program, right? Building mm -hmm. a winning team. If you're going to win the long haul, you have to put team players in leadership spots. You know, because if we were to promote... The, if we were to promote based on metrics alone, a lot of us would be in a lot of trouble, right? Because sometimes our best metrics person doesn't necessarily fit our culture, you know, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a person who's maybe not at the top of the totem pole metrics wise is the best team player we have. And they're mm -hmm. both equally valuable, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. one can show their value more than others in, in moments. But the, but the point being is that overall, the more team players you hire, the more you have an opportunity to be more versatile with them. And mm -hmm. you can always train them and coach them to be rock star salespeople or service writers, but you have to have the foundation first that they have an understanding that being a part of this team means that you'll do anything and everything for anyone that's on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were to, like, like we were saying, if you were to grade, your best guys by metrics alone, you may not get those players, right? You may get right. the, the home run hitters that are in it for them and not necessarily mm -hmm. for the team, which I understand that too. And I understand there's a need for those folks. They perform in a different way. But when it comes to leadership, your team player is probably going to take that team a lot further because they understand the buy-in portion of it from the bottom to the top. And mm -hmm. that's that's what makes it so important. Let let's up uh, let's shift gears a little bit, right? And talk about a little bit about your so vast experience here. Obviously, you, you've already given us such a wealth of knowledge about you know people development. Well, if, here. if I could just end that cap piece, uh, yeah, sure. Well. So one of the things I do in all of my dealerships when I go in is I have a weekly managers meeting, right? And I expect each manager, so I want all the managers in the meeting. So I want my sales managers or my GSM to know what the markup is in my parts department. So when they go to get a part and they say, you know how much that part costs? And I said, yeah, didn't you see we're at 42% markup? I mean, did, did you not pick that up? In the, and they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and, but, but really why I do that is, is, is so that other department heads can offer something. So if somebody's struggling with someone – Maybe someone from the, my, my finance director, for example, can offer something to my parts manager. My parts manager could offer something to a GSM. 
you know, everybody contributes as a family together. But the mm-hmm. other thing that I, I'm big on in those meetings, so we've identified our, our bench players, right? So what are we doing with them? Well, what I do is bring them to that manager meeting. And what's talked about in that meeting stays in that meeting. So they get a whole new level. And the feedback I get from them or holy crap, like I really see now what's in front of me and what really goes on in running an operation. So they get thinking bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do you think that does to their blood? Gets it going. So when they get back to their desk, they're going harder. They're a part of the team. They see their future and it just helps grow them. And then you can rely on them when you start picking out their replacements. Right. And I Give just them think that- that's a great culture. Giving them that bird's eye view, just a little, a yeah. little glimpse of that bird's eye view of where we're really going mm-hmm. here, instead of mm-hmm. just instead of just looking at their one little puzzle piece, right? Like yeah, when absolutely. they see the whole puzzle, it's like, oh, I get it. Wow, that that mm-hmm. makes so much more sense, right? Instead mm-hmm. of just you know in their own or little arena with their own little puzzle piece, that's that's such wonderful insight, and that transparency probably goes a long way with all those leaders, right? And well, so, and the best part is that first meeting when you go into a deal, or at least when I go into a dealership and I tell them what we're going to do in the first meeting, you know, it's like closing a car deal where you, you know, the customer <laughs> sitting on the ceiling, you got to pull them down. I, I would literally sometimes have to pull managers down, but I'd say your department's going to do this much, and they'd be like, "Holy crow, we've never." Right. <laughs> and I'd say, "But hang on a second, I wanted you to let that settle in for a second. Now I'm going to walk you through how we're going to get there. So you need to have that right. overall plan, and you can't just fly by the seat of your pants." So how critical is it for a dealership to have, let's call it an ongoing program or an ongoing, yeah, yeah, an ongoing program of sorts that keeps all the departments inspired, well-oiled and efficient. And, you know, why, why would you say this isn't more popular in the corporate structure? Because it seems like, you know, we see it every day. I'm sure you have seen it in your decades of knowledge here. It seems like having a full time coach or somebody to to at least hold you accountable for your goals and where you're heading and your vision is critical for most big businesses, right? Uh, that mm-hmm. have so many moving parts and different departments, and I call it like kind of like a grandfather clock. That one cog can't move without the other, right? No matter how small or how big it is. How mm-hmm. critical is it for a dealership to have uh, some sort of coaching regimen or campaign or ongoing program to help? keep their, you know, keep them in line and keep their goals straight and their vision right. So I, I, uh, I think I can speak on this uh, very clearly. Um, I think it's harder for private cap dealers to have that. We're going to, let's break this down to two different ways. Sure. So a, a big company like AutoNation actually has that. They've got uh, somebody in charge of, you know, who's, who will oversee all the sales departments, work with internet departments, for example, on closing metrics and things like that, have a finance person that oversees all the finance departments that will come in and help run the play and train and stuff like that. They have incredible resources, but they're a huge public company, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And they have to, and and then it's up to the GM to align with those people. And this is going to go private cap or, or big corporations, Sonic Auto Nation and stuff. So then the GM has to align with those people and not treat them as outsiders Right. But I would marry up with them. And I, they were always welcome in my store. I wanted to marry up with them. I give them direction, what I needed help with as far as coaching and things go. Might be my managers, might be salespeople, might be service people, whatever the case may be. So these big public companies have access to things like that. Um, the private cap, it's a little bit different. And here's what I found over the years. Now, remember, I was a, a 10 cell promoter. So sometimes we'd have 10, 12 dealers. In, in our tent sales. So I work with a lot of different owners and stuff like that along the way. Um, but sometimes I think it's insecurity by the person running the show, the decision maker. It's like, yeah, mm. I can train that or I can do that. Well, sure. yeah, you yeah. can, but you don't have the hours in the day to do it. And right. often, you know, an outside perspective from somebody else will just solidify what you have. I think, and and this is part of my wellness company, and we'll talk about a little bit later, but I think that you need to align together, not go in like I'm smarter than you are. Yeah, you know, you're you're on a pedestal. You can't be like that. It's got to be a team that goes in together. And when you hear that one unified message, it works. If you come in and, you know, somebody's not buying in at the top on your program, you're dead in the water. There's nowhere Mm -hmm. to go. 
because that creates a really bad culture where the salespeople want to run to, to the, you know, the person coming into the dealership, you know, and then the person that's bringing that person in doesn't want that person in the dealership. So it becomes a vicious hamster wheel of, of, of just a bad culture, bad way to go. So if, if people recognize that these people are here to help align with them and go, I, I think that's the winning formula. But when they're not so sure, it, it, yeah. it start the wheels come off the car, man. Well, you know, it's so funny you say that. We actually, uh, uh, we actually had a situation where we uh, we went into a we went into a cultural assessment visit one day, which is like our initial visit with a, with a dealer. Mm -hmm. And we asked we asked a, a, a front line. Well, we asked to, actually we asked an upper level manager. You know what what is it that you want to accomplish, or what do you want to work on with us being here and and be coaching your your dealership? And that person responded by saying. Uh, you know, I don't have anything to work on. I'm perfectly fine the way that I am. And uh, one of our colleagues was like, oh, wow, congratulations on perfection. How did you do it? And, you know, like, it was just like, you know, and, it, you know, obviously they were taken aback by that comment. But but the truth of the matter is like, you know, that you're you're absolutely right. There's a lot of leaders out there that feel like they've got it figured out. And it's when you start saying that kind of stuff that, you're you're showing the the folks who really understand how to coach and how to motivate people that okay maybe this guy really needs to we need to really expand on some blind spots in this guy's arena right and we need to figure out how to let him know that there's more to people development than probably what he thinks or she thinks you know it's it's an ongoing it's been an ongoing issue in the automotive industry and that's that's why we pledged to coach the car business and that's why you do what you do, right? Because we were trying to change that narrative. We're trying to change that. Uh, you yeah, know, but sometimes you can't. Around. And you, you, sure. you yeah. sometimes can't. I had a marketing company when I left AutoNation and I, and I left my business partner in the dealership I had. And I was, I was working with a bunch of different dealers fixing them and stuff. I had a digital marketing uh, agency where I would do a lot of used car marketing uh, digitally for dealers. Mm -hmm. And I would get dealers calling me up saying, well, if your results say, you know, are what they say, I go, well, it's not what I say. I can actually give you the results off of, say, Facebook or wherever we're doing the digital marketing. I can actually give you the results. Well, if they, if they are what they say, I, I, and then I'm stopping them. I'm like, are you trying to tell me this billion-dollar company is pumping out fake results? <laughs> and, and they're like, yeah, if, you, if, if they are what they say, they and I'm like, all right, listen, brother, <laughs> we're not going to work together because you'll never get it. I can already tell you right now. And then they'd be begging me, no, you've got to come. I'm like, I don't got to do anything. Right. We're Sometimes it just do doesn't it. make sense. Yeah. I'm not going to fight with you over your results. I'm just not going to do it. This is the opening conversation. We're done. You know, right. you just got to move on. I mean, well, you know, you got to move you, on. You kind of touched on technology there just a tad bit. Um, last question, and we'll kind of get into uh, your current business, what you're doing. But we we like to pair a lot of technology with our coaching and stuff like that too. And and one of the things we find is that utilization of technology is very hit or miss depending on who you who you visit, right? So in your in in your expertise and your experience, did you find that utilization of technology tools that help? Tools that the dealerships invest in to help grow their business, or they say, right, they, they, they invest in mm -hmm. it for the purpose of growing their business, right? Over the years, has it made it more efficient, or do you think that technology is underutilized, and, and why do you think that is? Um, different dealers, different mindsets. Again, having ran a digital uh, media company as well with that, um, I think that some dealers just will never accept technology. Um, some of the uh, older dealers are just stuck in their ways and it's just, it's, you know, it's just not going to happen. They, it's, we've been doing it this way forever. You know, they're waiting for the auto trader magazine to come back, you know, <laughs> not, it's like the, the listen dude, I'm telling you. Um, but, but there's that on the other side of it, um, there's some great technology and there's new technologies constantly coming out. And I think it's not getting bogged down in a zillion different things. Find what works for you and utilize them. I was a stats mm -hmm. freak, so I love technology and I would study it. I would study my numbers. Matter of fact, you can be thinking that you're sucking, your like, things aren't growing and this, this and that. And then I would tell my management team, download your numbers and look at them. And what do your numbers tell you? Oh, actually, we're growing. 
Yeah, there you go. Give yourself a pat in the back. Because there's so much in the automotive business, right? There's so much negativity that flies at people, right? Um, that sometimes they get caught up in it. And sometimes you just got to take a, a, a 30,000 foot view and say, well, hang on, actually, we are growing. And we're gaining market share. And our service department numbers are coming up and this and this and that. And you only find that via your technology and the numbers it produces, right? And it makes you way more efficient. You've got efficiency and speed is is got to be paramount. You know, you 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 know the 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 speed to getting the cars online. You know, how fast can you get this car? You you just went and did a street purchase on a car. How fast can you get it through the shop and everything else and up online? You know, yeah. so so your service writer writing the ticket at the desk. It's coming up on a computer in the shop versus the old walking back. And you, people don't understand, but even that going back and forth saves time right there's mm -hmm. so many different things obviously crm systems crm systems are growing uh, dramatically um you know there's just so much technology but you can't get bogged down in, in a zillion different things you've got to find what works for you keeps you focused and then jump in on it and go and, you and know, make we, sure everybody knows how to use it too yeah but see that's the thing too is like make sure everyone's on the same page about training right and so you know you can tell a lot about when you visit a sales manager and you're like okay how do you know that this car is going to sell? And they look at you and say, well, it's Ford Bronco. That's why it's going to sell. And then, you know, the intuition, right? And then you have the guys, you know, how do you know this car is going to sell? It's like, well, I priced it. It's number one in, in V Auto's fair market value in the 350 mile radius. You know, that's how I know it's going to sell. And like out of one out of 59 cars, it's number one in the fair market value. And I was like, okay, I hear you. I, I know that you're, you're one of those guys, right? So you kind of know who you're working with. The moment they start speaking the mm -hmm. stats and like using V Auto, obviously a, a universally great tool for pricing your cars. Um, that's all exciting things, and and, I, and thank you for shedding your light on technology because obviously um, it's not going anywhere. And you know the, no. the uh, you know as we embrace it, it does get easier to use. It does get simpler, and don't bog like you said. Great advice. Don't bog down yourself doing sixteen different softwares that do thirty different things. Find what works for you. And utilize mm -hmm. that and use it to the best of its ability, right? Until you need to yeah. use something else for some reason. So, okay, shifting gears, let's talk about what you're currently doing, right? Unity Wellness. Um, it just seems like such an exciting thing you got going here. Um, major growth sector. What was the genesis of this business? Uh, uh, was it an epiphany? Was it like a long desired project, something that's been your baby for a long time? Or is it just like kind of like a spur of the moment idea? How did all this start? When you're running a Mercedes-Benz dealership and you're in the top 20 in the nation, you don't have spur-of-the-moment ideas. You, you have <laughs> well, I can attest to that. Uh, like not running I one, left, but being no, a manager, I can attest to that. Nobody could believe I left when I left. Like, nobody could believe that. Everybody thought I was going to take another job. Like, literally, that's what everybody thought. And I went to lunch with uh, Steve Quack, the COO of uh, AutoNation, on a Thursday, and I told Steve, uh, he and I go way, way, way back. And I told Steve that I had bought this company. Um, I was, I'm always into, so I have type 2 diabetes and I'm really into wellness and things like that. During the pandemic, mm -hmm. for example, I sat in my car outside the dealership and I said, I'm going to, when, when I start taking insulin, I gain 150 pounds. And so I said, I'm going to actually drop 100 pounds and I'm going to go on keto. I'm going to add an intermittent fasting and I'm going to exercise. All the gyms were closed. I work out at Gold's Gym in Venice Beach. All the gyms were closed, right? And so I dropped 112 pounds during the pandemic. So I've always been into wow. that. I'm really big in the type 2 diabetes community. I'm a, I'm a brand spokesman for Dexcom, type2diabetes.com, diabetes mm -hmm. management, a lot of, a lot of different uh, type 2 things. Um, uh, matter of fact, I just was nominated for an award for my work in the type 2 community. Congratulations. Um, so I've, well, thank you. I've really been into that. And that was a big part of my dealership play, too. It's mental wellness, mental health, mindset, and, and also physical health. So once I would tell people in my dealership I was a type 2 diabetic, I had so many people coming to me privately telling me the same thing. So I could keep glucose cap uh, tablets in my office of some of these. You know, I could recognize that they're having a, a fall on their, on their blood sugar levels and things like that, right? So it was always very important to me. This company came up. And, um, and it was just perfect for me. Um, and I started thinking about everything I do in the dealership as far as mindfulness and stuff like that goes. 
again, turning around my dealerships, we're really teaching people how to become winners again, right? So I started thinking, I was like, you know, I can do this and I can go into a lot of dealers and other companies and teach them how to become winners again, doing what I do and putting it all under my wellness label. So, so we're a boutique company. We can do anything that somebody might need, whether it be the, the uh, employee's health, uh, setting up programs for them, setting up people to manage the programs, uh, mindfulness, really big on that, uh, working with sports teams, pro athletes. We're talking to a, a professional team, a um, uh, professional league right now, as a matter of fact. Um, so that's how that all came about. Look, I've done, I think, just about everything I can do in the automotive industry. I want to teach that to other people. And that's the, the, the genesis of buying this company. They're based in Chicago. I just moved them out here to LA. I'm just getting the final deliveries here. Um, and, um, and I'm about to roll it all out to, uh, to offer to dealers, to, to other businesses and stuff too. But I, I think it's the future and I think it's the way to go. The other thing about the automotive industry is, one thing I really noticed inside and outside of public companies, and remember, I work for Sonic as well, and I've got mm -hmm. friends that run companies. That my, my, I have a lot of high-level friends. And sometimes there's a detachment. A really good car guy gets to a level in a company, and then underneath that person, that detachment goes. And the amount of downward pressure on employees is immense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's immense. Yeah. So anxiety and all this stuff. So, so my thought was, how about I teach these people, right? how to reduce their anxiety, how to get in the flow, how to get in the zone. They'll be much more productive um, and they'll start winning again. And that's how I turned all these dealerships around was teaching these same people, people who had lost money for years. I would take the same crew, right? And teach them how to be winners again. And magically we would turn around, store would be great. I'd hand it off to another GM and I'd go on to my next project. This is what I do. So mm -hmm. why not try to show this to, to other dealers and, and, and other businesses, and, and we're going into schools and stuff too. So I'm super excited about it, really, really excited about it. But, I mean, I don't know where else there was to go, I mean, as far as the automotive industry. I mean, you know, going out and spending millions and millions of dollars to buy a Ben store or something. I mean, that's literally what was left, right? You know, you you kind of uh, you hit it home with me here a little bit. Um, kind of, this is an interesting question. This one's not on the record. Well, it is on the record. It will be on the podcast, but this is not in my lust list of questions or ideas for questions mm -hmm. that I had for this. But, you know, talking about how you, you work really closely with people in the type 2 diabetes community and, and uh, just a little backstory on, on, on a little bit of my personal life. You know, my wife is a breast cancer survivor as of last year. Sure. Um, my, my, and I have family members that have Parkinson's and uh, also diabetes. Actually, I coach high school football, and one of one of my seniors last year uh, was getting in there, making tackles, and coming off the field and checking his blood sugar at the same time. And, mm -hmm. and it's just like it's a it's a real battle. It's a real bat. No matter what it is that you're dealing with, it could be type two diabetes, it could be cancer, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. uh, ALS. You know, a lot of things. It's a real battle to to maintain uh, some sort of normalcy, right? And some yeah. sort of you know, that was one of the big things that they kept preaching to my wife and I kept preaching to my wife was trying to maintain some sense of normalcy. And that's just so we, we don't realize, you know, that how difficult that is for people who have, you know, ailments or, or people who have sicknesses or, or battling certain diseases, how hard it is to just maintain a little sliver of normalcy while they're at mm -hmm. home, much less at work or 100 percent, you know so in in just kind of to cap this entire conversation and in your experience with your wellness company what would you say is the greatest advice you could give folks out there who are battling something that have to still go to work every day to help them maintain a little bit of normalcy to help their day just to get a little bit better and to feel a little bit more familiar for them i think uh community involvement because again, I would announce that every dealership I went into, and it was amazing how many people came to me either privately or out in the open and said, yeah, I'm a type two diabetic, or I've been told I'm a pre-diabetic. Um, you know, I've got family members who are, um, you know, battling cancer. I, uh, there's a doctor, he got his doctorate in uh, Los Angeles at UCLA, and he runs a hospital in Toronto. And uh, he wrote a book called The Cancer Code. His name's Dr. Jason Fung. He wrote the mm -hmm. obesity code, the diabetes code, and he wrote the cancer code. And he also wrote a book on intermittent fasting. 
a matter of fact, I took a master class with him on fasting. And um, wow. uh, I probably gave that book to at least 16 employees over the last two years who have wow. had people dealing with, with cancer, let alone diabetes. Um, and I think just, um, you know, like a, a support community. So somebody knows, you know, look, as a type two diabetic, you don't get up in the morning and run out the door. You've got to check your <laughs> blood sugar. You so many things pills. you got to do. Yeah. 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 You might have to take insulin. You know, I was on 2,100 units of insulin a week. And when I dropped all the weight um, uh, down to about 130 and I plan to be off insulin oh. by the end of the year. So okay. that's the road I took. And mm -hmm. I've helped so many employees over the years. Now let's take it to another level. So what we're talking about now is just your experience and my experience. When you've got 200 employees, how many of these experiences are there, right? Oh, how 100%. Days, it, it's am, it's how amazing. Many days are you, yeah, how many days are you losing to sick days? How many days when somebody's just, just tuned out at their desk, that they're not productive? Like how much are you losing by not addressing issues like this? Right. Whereas I, I believe when, when my company can come in, we can help with that. And you're going to add more money to your bottom line. Plus, you're going to have healthier and happier employees. That's really, really what I want to do. So right. uh, I'm and I'm not super to mention, not to mention, right? When you build the right culture, right? When you build the winning culture that you that you're looking forward to, and you have the right management team and leadership, mm -hmm. people people that are even the people that are ailing will actually still look forward to coming to work. Because sure they, they feel supported. Because they feel mm -hmm. supported. They feel like family. They're valued there. It gives them purpose. Right? These are mm -hmm. things that are huge to anyone, but even more so to someone who's suffering with something that, that they can't really get rid of or can't just offload in, at any given moment, you know? Especially mm -hmm. people who who battle cancer and diabetes, these long term these long term ailments that they they can do nothing about but just keep themselves alive. So, so how these, many how many people are there in the US? There's what? 3 330 million or okay. yeah, something like that. Yeah. So so there's 39 million diabetics and 93 wow. million pre-diabetics. And with pre-diabetes, most of these people uh, they're not even diagnosed. Oh my god, that's so a third that's of the country. Almost, yeah. I was just going to say. So when you look at your dealership now, Think about that as a 30-year dealership just dealing with that, let alone cancer and, and other uh, things that are out there. But just with that piece alone, and how much are you losing to people that are just trying to get through the day that, that, yeah. that don't have any direction or support? And how much more could you do being the person that's at the forefront of that and helping these people? A, a reminder to our automotive leaders out there, well, really any of our business leaders out there, if you have 80% 90% healthy employees on any given day, count your blessings. You're a very lucky mm -hmm. individual because you never know tomorrow could bring a completely different scenario. Sure. Um, Dan, um, look, this is this. gosh, I wish we could go on forever. I really yeah. do. <laughs> and we maybe, maybe there's a second episode in our future to sure. really unpack some more stuff. But before we go, Dan, I want to, I want to give you the floor for the next few minutes if there's you know anything else that you want to tell our community, uh, have at it, my brother. Well, I, I think, again, it just gets back to all we have as, uh, and I'll just speak as a, as a uh, general manager, but all you've got is your horses. And your horses will perform based upon how you treat them. Um, support them. Again, I, I thought in my world, when I go into a dealership, it's two things. Number one, uh, a healthy bottom line and number two healthier and happier employees and growing those employees and i think that if you can kind of keep that in mind even on the worst days right on the worst days um keep that in mind uh remember these people are dealing with a lot of negativity right what what's the what, what's a great closing percentage in selling a car right let's mm -hmm. just say you're a rock star and you close 20 percent of your customers right mm -hmm. that's eight out of ten people are telling you no Right. So, you right. know, these people are very resilient, man. And they and they come in and they put the effort in and, and they go with it. And, and you're going to have that pack that does that. And you're going to have that pack that's sort of on the outside. But when they see this this energy and and the success with people, it becomes infectious and people get caught up in it. And that's how you really create a winning team. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to go into some some dealerships and 
and share my program and, and, uh, you know, AutoNation and all these other dealers used to ask me all the time, what's your secret sauce? What's your secret sauce? And uh, I'm excited to go share that secret sauce with as many people as I can, have as much fun doing it and uh, and helping other people grow. So, and you know, in the world, like you were saying, and just to kind of bring this all to a close, and for our leaders out there that watch this in a world full of negativity, give your employees something positive to look forward to. Right. Yeah. And even if that means just coming to work every day and giving them the hello that they need to get through the day and giving them mm-hmm. the, hey, that that shirt looks great on you to get them through the day or, hey, you're really crushing it. Keep up the good work in a world full of negativity. Give them something positive to hang on, guys. And walk your store and high five people. I was yes. amazed how many dealerships over all the years inside, outside, everywhere I would go and walk the shop every day. That was a big part of my play. And people say, I never saw last GM for like three months. I'm like, oh, they, to me, it was the most interesting part of my day. Nobody's grinding me. I don't even a report. I'm just going to see what's going on with the guys or gals. You know, I mean, it was it was fantastic. I loved it. So Dan, Dan was a great way to make a living, man. You, you, you were singing praises, brother. And you're right. It is a great way to make a living. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Turner here. Obviously, we've talked former Canadian heavyweight champion, but even bigger than that, uh, you've just made a, a massive impact on millions of lives, especially coming from humble beginnings. Uh, the impact that you've made on thousands, millions of lives across time is immeasurable. And uh, we thank you well, so we've, much we've for got, coming on today. We've got millions of more to 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 really impact, and I'm really looking forward. You can reach yeah. me at uh, dan at unitywellnessgroup.com, uh, um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. You can follow me on all my social. Again, I'm big in the diabetes community, so it's Diabetes Army on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube. Matter of fact, I'm running a YouTube series where I'm going to drop another 40 pounds, and I just nice. put week one up. So when we're talking about health, uh, you know, this is what we're talking about. So it's Diabetes Army on all of those, but uh, Dan at Unity Wellness Group, and I look forward to having any conversation. I hit everybody back, so uh, let's have some fun. Yeah. And, and let's grow some people, and let's get our dealers profitable while we're doing it. Absolutely. All of our motivators out there, make sure you follow them on the socials. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. This guy is the real deal. Dan Turner a man of all seasons. Thank you so much for jumping on with us today. Um, can't wait to have you back. Gosh, I feel like we really just scratched the surface. Wow. But, um, man, continued success to you, my brother. And, uh, man, this has been a great – we've been – look, this was a great lot walk. We walked a lot. Yeah. We talked about a lot of great stuff. Um, tune in next time. Uh, don't We don't have a prospective guest coming on the lot walk, but rest assured – We've got some interesting stuff coming in the coming months, so stay tuned. Follow the channel. Follow the Car Motivators Podcast Network. Uh, My name is Chaz Kelly. I am the host of The Lot Walk. He's Dan Turner. He is the man with the plan on every level, (laughs) and we will see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you coming on.